Um, it's my pleasure to introduce our two speakers today. Um, we have Dr. Molly Heyer and Dr. Stacy Wall. Um, Dr. Heyer received her PhD in neuroscience from the University of Maryland and is currently an Arachta Fellow here at ECU, um, working in Dr. Gretchen's Nay. Gretchen Ney's lab in anatomy and neurobiology, where she's studying the impact of environmental stressors on neuroimmune function. Dr. Wall received her PhD in biomedical science from the University of Medicine and Dentistry at Rutgers University, and she has been an Arachta scholar here at VCU and is currently working on an NIH postdoctoral fellowship where she's studying the genetic mechanisms that underlie facial development and how those mechanisms are altered in Down syndrome. She's also an adjunct faculty member um, in the biology department teaching cell and molecular biology. So we're excited to hear what you all have to say about how to engage um, students in faculty uh, lecture. So thank you. Okay, so we are talking today about implementing effective assessments of student learning in scientific teaching. And we'll get into exactly what we mean about that, but I think we wanted to start with a little bit of an activity. Yeah. Right? Um, but let's do, yeah, first, uh, let's mention this first. Yeah, yeah. Um, one of the things that we, um, so as um, Pam mentioned, Stacy and I are both ERACTA fellows, um, which is Institutional Research and Career Development Award, um, and it's an NIH funded postdoctoral fellowship. And through that, Stacy and I attended a summer institute on scientific teaching this summer. And, um, you know, the joke about reading through all of the uh, terms and agreements before just clicking yes. <laughs> so we actually got caught in one of these situations where we just clicked yes, and then they reminded us that written in those terms and agreements was we have to take something back to our institution from the workshop and actually present it in an official capacity. Obviously not a bad thing in this case, luckily. <laughs> but So that's part of um, why we were really excited to share this. And where a lot of the information that you guys are going to see is coming from. So, uh, yeah. And we have links and resources to the summer teaching institutes at the end of the presentation as well. Um, cool. Yeah. Okay. Oh, it's a tricky one. Okay, so we are going to be talking about different types of assessment. And to use that, or to do that, we wanted to start with an example of a type of assessment. So we're actually going to do it, and then we can refer to it through our talk. So this is, what we want to do is a concept map. Has anyone ever done a concept map before? Right on. Okay, so a concept map is basically whatever you want it to be. We have six terms up here, and we want you to kind of get with the people around you. If you're unsure of who to work with, just look and smile. Somebody will be your friend. And we want you to connect these six words. They can be connected in any way that makes sense to you. Okay? And we'll take about five minutes to do that. <laughs> we have some kind of we have some kind of Okay, let's kind of wrap up and discuss what we kind of hold together here. Um, so, does any group want to share their concept map? Jonathan. Yes. <laughs> so, uh, the way it's we, the bad side of know, me knowing your name. <laughs> the way we we uh, organized this in our math was to go down the list, uh, and to us it was like a way of going in order with things. So DNA to RNA to protein is essentially the um, uh, kind of goes hand in hand with gene expression for DNA, transcription for uh, for RNA, and translation for protein, but I'm also progressing down the list, and that's fashion. Does so anybody have anything to add to that? Can anyone do anything different? And that sounds excellent. Great job. <laughs> yeah, so all of these terms are related to the central dogma of molecular biology, right? And so they're connected. And so this is what an example of a way to engage students that you can use in a variety of situations. It could be at the beginning of the semester before they've even ever been exposed to these words, and you just want to say, do you understand what any of them mean? So a concept that could have been words I know what they mean, words I don't know what they mean. That still counts. It could be used at the end, after we've talked about it for a while, to say, like, how do these terms relate to each other? And you can give more instructions to make it a more specific or more difficult task, yeah. right? 
And a lot of what um, we'll see, if any of you were here for Jason's How to Talk, um, the card sorting task day, you'll see some overlap between that and today. Um, but a lot of this is how, how do you categorize information um, and how can we do different categorizing of this information at different points in the learning process. So our kind of main question is, how do we engage our students? Um, and so how did Stacy and I just engage you? You guys came in here. We don't know what level any of you all are at. We don't know what your interests are. We don't know what your fields are. But we, the very first thing we did, since this is an active learning talk, was to immediately do an active learning assignment and to engage you with your peers and for us to engage with you all as well by walking around the room. And so we automatically set up kind of an active learning environment. And so by doing this initial assessment, this concept map that we did straight up, um, we incorporated an assessment to kind of gauge what y'all's interests were and how you work together as a peer group. And so in the Black and William, which were two researchers that studied um, how assessment impacted classroom learning, um, they emphasized, oh, excuse me, they emphasize that ongoing assessment plays a key role, possibly the most critical role, in shaping classroom standards and increasing learning gains. And so in a lot of the educational fields, the idea of implementing assessment in the classroom from day one and throughout the entire period of learning is essential to learning gains. And then, in, in fact, it may be the most essential part of improving learning gains. So when we think about assessment, do you guys hear grading? Okay, so one thing that we want to do is sort of separate those two things today. Assessment doesn't necessarily mean that it's something that you're going to have to grade. So when we think about incorporating it throughout our courses, it doesn't necessarily mean adding a lot to our workload, which is why kind of our motto for today and all of these techniques that we're going to talk about is that small actions can lead to big change. Because if you can implement some of these assessments as formative assessments throughout the semester, students will better be able to assess their own learning, which will then help them to perform better in the course. It'll also give you more opportunities to assess, is what I'm saying actually being conveyed how I want it to be conveyed, right? <coughs> so a lot of times we'll talk and talk and talk, and then we'll get to a test and be like, wow, they did not understand the last opera. I spent 20 minutes on it, and it just did not go home. That's OK. But it would be nice if we found a way to learn that right after it happened versus waiting until it's a graded material. And so how many of you have kind of heard of active learning or assessments in the classroom? And how many of you are a little bit intimidated by implementing active learning in the classroom? So a lot of people express that. And part of what Stacy was just emphasizing and part of this motto is that a lot of the times, especially if you're an ex experienced instructor, or if you're just starting off for the first time and you're just kind of like trying to organize a class in some capacity, or if you've had a class organized for the last 10 years and it's been going okay, how do you say, say, oh my gosh, how do I have the time to do all this stuff? This sounds like a lot of work to make this class like active and engaging and really exciting. But what we're gonna kind of go through and emphasize is that small actions can equal big change. And so you can do really little small activities throughout the course of the semester that can kind of shape this active learning environment while not necessarily having to restructure the entire class um, or put in the full-blown active learning engagement um, that you may see other people encouraging. So small actions can definitely lead to big changes uh, within the active learning classroom. Okay, so we talked about we're going to talk about two different ki kinds of assessment, formative and summative assessment. Are you guys familiar with those terms? No. no. OK. So formative assessments are assessments that are for learning. This is during the teaching event. This is these questions where I say, like, do you understand what I'm saying? Let's do an activity to see what you took away from this lesson. It's assessments that are during the learning process that can allow you to adjust what you're doing as the instructor to make sure that the material is being conveyed. 
So the example that we gave this morning, or the beginning of this talk, when you guys first came in, that was an example of a formative assessment. So say this was an introductory biology course, and we wanted to know how you all processed the core dogma of biology, then we would have had an idea of what you guys knew already by looking at your concepts ma concept maps, and by going around and talking to each of the groups and saying, okay, how did they process and put all of these terms together? That's a formative assessment. Okay, summative assessments occur at the end of learning. This is what we think about when we think about exams, projects, quizzes even sometimes. These are something that we do at the end of a teaching event to see how well the information has been learned. Okay, this is probably something that everyone has certainly experienced in a class, but you've also probably designed some form of a summative assessment. And so both of these can be used at varying points um, throughout the semester um, with the card sorting task that Jason did a couple weeks ago. You could imagine doing that as a formative assessment where students first come in and you would say, okay, you have all these terms on cards, how do you relate them to each other? And that kind of gives you this initial assessment, but then as we go along and you do a more summative assessment, as Jason talked about, then they might sort by more deeper, more meaningful context of what those terms were. And so that's an example of how a similar task could be used in both formative and summative assessment environments. And grading can be incorporated into both of these pieces. It's fair. These are types of assessment that's independent of grading. How we grade and what values we assign to these is another piece. Okay, so here's some terms about, or some ideas about what specifically formative assessment does. Um, so first and foremost, it can address students' misconceptions. And so this is very beneficial very early on in the learning period when you're trying to gauge what people know and what they don't know and what possible misconceptions they might have. And so by doing a formative assessment at the very beginning of the learning experience, you can get an idea of what are their misconceptions. And of course, in the sciences, which Stacey and I both um, are in, it can be very useful because people oftentimes have some pretty significant misconceptions about a lot of these core ideas. And so as Stacy emphasized a little bit already, one of the most important things about formative assessment is that it allows students to monitor their understanding by giving you something to provide feedback on. And you're doing it at a very early stage. So by implementing an early formative assessment, you can provide feedback to your students at a very early time point. And again, emphasizing this is not necessarily grading, but I can be walking around and see what your concept maps look like and start to be like, oh, okay, oh, you put RNA over with uh, gene transcription. Well, maybe you might want to think about not doing that in that direct pathway. Maybe this is a different way. So you can start to give feedback to your students in real time very early on in the period. Yep, this also causes the students to practice retrieving information and forming associations. Okay, you're asking students to do this work in kind of a low stress, safer way. It's not something that they're being graded on, so they might feel more free to try things and things that don't work, and that's all right. And it also gives them the opportunity to connect different concepts. Okay, so it's more practicing, so when they get to the exam, it's not the first time that they've practiced how to use the information that you're giving them. And then finally, again, in this vein of feedback, it provides you as the instructor feedback on how your students are doing and how they're responding to the material that you are trying to teach them. Because one of the things that Stacy already kind of mentioned and that can be a big barrier in the learning experience is that you as the instructor are the expert and you know all the material that you are presenting to your students. And so oftentimes it can be difficult as the instructor to gauge whether or not your students have actually learned what you were trying to teach them. And so by having these formative assessments wrapped in throughout the course, you can pick up better whether your students are actually learning what you're teaching them or whether they're not really putting these things together. And so this is an opportunity for you to get feedback and the students to get feedback both from each other and from you. Okay, and then, so, summative assessments are the other type, and they enable the instructor to monitor student progress over the semester. What are they actually learning? Okay, and you can adapt formative assessments to summative assessments by providing information on how the formative assessment will be graded. So you can give a rubric, which will show the this, this student, this is the criteria that I'm evaluating your concept map on. You know, for example, do you connect the words in a way that makes logical sense? Do you use active verbs to connect them? Depending on what the instructions are, you're giving them as much information as possible so that they understand how they're being evaluated. Right? 
So it's very, it's a natural progression to make assessments into a graded assignment. Um, and so one of the things that we kind of wanted to, as we've already stressed, is that assessment doesn't necessarily mean grading, but it certainly can. But what we want to emphasize is that you need to have a rubric so your students understand what the expectations are. And so you can go through like this concept map that we did, and you can have it be a non-graded assignment where you're literally just assessing what their knowledge base is, or if you provide a rubric and with some of the uh, caveats that Stacey just mentioned or some of the um, structure that she mentioned, you can turn it into an easily gradable assignment. So that's totally up to you and there's a lot of flexibility there. Um, but that, you know, these assessments don't have to be graded, but they can have a natural progression, progression into a graded assessment. Okay, so then we're thinking about how do we design these assessments. Like, I feel like we've been trying to sell you on the importance of them, and hopefully we have. So then how do you get to a point where you know actually what you want to do? You sit down with the lesson, and you're like, okay, an action potential. How does this work? And you need to get from, I have an idea of a topic I want to teach, to an activity. Okay? So what we really stress, and what education literature is kind of, like the hallmark of education literature, is doing this backwards design, where your objectives drive your, assess your assessments and your instruction, okay? So you start by saying like, what should students know or be able to do by the end of your course? And you use that to build your learning goals and objectives. How you get there is these assessments. So these assessments are how you're conveying the material to them and how you are assessing whether or not they understand it, okay? And then what will you do to get them there is the actual activities, okay? So we'll go through an example with our concept map. So you can see sort of how we would build that. But this is what we want to think about. We want to make sure that the activities that we're designing reflect what we want them to learn. Yeah, so they're reflecting your goals and objectives. And specifically, Bloom's Taxonomy can help you align your activities with your objectives. And so is anyone familiar with Bloom's Taxonomy? So Bloom's Taxonomy is a very common um, list of terms to help you identify what the level of learning is. Um, and here is an example of what the different levels are. There's been a couple of recent kind of remodification of this. Um, and so you can see the different terms that Bloom's Taxonomy uses. And so all of these are valuable, and they're all valuable at different points in the learning experience. Um, so one of the, of course, initial ones is remembering, which is kind of the first foremost thing that people need to be learning when they're first learning a new field or new set of concepts. Memorization isn't the most fun, but a lot of the times that's what really needs to happen. And that's totally fine. And you can see that's the base of the pyramid here. But once we have kind of a base factual knowledge, then we can start moving into, okay, how do we understand what we've remembered? Oh, and then how can we apply that? And then analyzing and all the way up to actually creating um, a concept around all of these lower levels. And so you can use these specific terms to kind of help define what your objectives are. So if you're in a freshman intro bio class in for general, uh, for the general requirements, you may be doing a lot more of this. But if you are teaching graduate students and you're trying to get them to initiate develop designing their own experiments, you may be a lot more up here. And so when you're thinking about what your goals and objectives are, you want to try to use these terms to specifically frame what those are and how appropriate they are for the learning level. And then you can use these terms to design your assessments and activities. Okay, so we, this activity grows out of the learning object, objective that students will understand the central dogma of biology, of molecular biology specifically. Okay, so then within a learning goal, you often have multiple objectives because central dogma is kind of a pretty big concept, right? So this is just one of them, that students will be able to demonstrate the relationships between DNA, RNA, and protein in terms of the central dogma, okay? And the assessment that we use will that is that they'll be able to illustrate the relationships between DNA, RNA, and protein. And the activity that allows us to assess whether or not they can illustrate it is our concept map. Okay? So this, when we look at our concept map and what we get out of our concept map, it will tell us if we've, it will give us an assessment and that it will tell us if we've met our learning goal. Okay? So when you're designing something, Sometimes it happens where you get to this assessment and then you reflect back to your learning goal and you're like, that's not actually what I wanted. When we first started doing this, our learning goal had something to do with mutations and stuff, but we got to this same activity. But then when we looked back at our learning goal, this learning goal doesn't talk about mutations, right? 
It really doesn't. Mutations are great, but this activity doesn't address it. So in that case, for us, since we are making the presentation, we just modified our goal. But if we needed to keep our goal the same for our course, we would know that this activity wouldn't work, and we'd need to design an activity that better reflected what we wanted the students to learn. And when we see all the, all the words that are underlined here in the goal, the objective, and the assessment are all from Bloom's taxonomy toolkits. Okay, so understanding is that base level goal. So then we looked at verbs that fit into that and use those to build from there to ensure that we're, all, we're also staying at the same level. Because you don't want to have an activity that's way up here for an objective that's down here or vice versa, right? And there's also, we've also included a link at the end of this PowerPoint that um, directs you to some uh, resource where you can look up terms that fit in with the different Bloom's taxonomy levels. Because um, obviously the word illustrate was not in that little pyramid, but it does fit in. So in the whole literature surrounding Bloom's taxonomy, illustrate is one of the terms that links with understand. Um, and so there's a whole host of verbs that can be accessed to help you kind of connect between uh, the, uh, the kind of st core structure of Bloom's taxonomy with what are you actually trying to do in the classroom. Okay. Any questions at this point about where we're going, where we've been? Right on. Okay, good deal. So this is um, hopefully, I hope, uh, the real reason why you guys are here is because you probably want some ideas of assessments. Um, and so one of the common fr phrases that's used is, what is your assessment toolkit? Or what is your active learning toolkit? And so we're going to go through some very specific examples of things that you guys can do tomorrow in your classroom um, to implement as assessments. They're very easy. They can be scaled up. They can be scaled down, depending on the learning level of your students. Um, we, of course, have no idea what level you guys are teaching, so that is totally up to you. Um, but these are all really great examples, and we pick them because we like them. And we yeah. both use them. <laughs> so we're going to go through these examples, and please ask questions at any point um, if you're confused about something. OK, so we started with the concept map. And to be fair, we did a lot of concept maps at the GCSI this summer. So Molly and I got very practiced in doing concept maps. But when we began, I was one of the people that was like, this is not enough structure. I don't like this. I don't know exactly what to do. Yeah. So this is something that's great to do throughout your semester. But it's important to remember that you're going to have students like me who might kind of be taken aback because they don't understand the lack of structure. So this is something that's a, a good indicator of what people are learning, but we got to be supportive as we implement it, right? I'm a very list-oriented person, so a nice creatively drawn web is not something I am initially inclined to do. I'm much more likely to put things in a list. Um, but what kind of beyond what Stacy's just talking about is if you implement this at the beginning of the learning period, the more you do it, the more different types of active learning assessments you incorporate, the better your students are going to get at it. And they're going to start expecting, oh, okay, these are things we're going to do. So even if you experience initial pushback from your students, don't give up because as, I mean, that's probably standard advice <laughs> <laughs> because they're going to push back no matter what you do. Um, but as you incorporate more of these assessments, they're going to get used to it and they're going to get experience with it and they're going to get more comfortable with it. And so at the beginning of the semester, you may have a Molly and Stacy group where like, we don't like the concept map, we want a list, we're not doing that. But then by the end, which by the end of the workshop, the week on the workshop we had, we had a really pretty great beautiful list. concept map yeah. of it, it had colors. It was very dynamic yeah. and much yeah. because we learned how to work within that framework. Yeah. And this is something that could be a small action. We're going to do concept maps. Directions are the same every single time. Yeah. How we assess them is the same every single time. Just the words change. Yeah. So this would be something that would be easy to implement as a beginning of a new topic activity. Every time we start a new topic, what do you know about it? Kind of awesome. Exactly. Clickers. Have any of you used clickers or Kahoot or anything like that? Do you like them? I would always forget them. <laughs> so. so it kind of depends on how you use them, right? Yeah. Like, but you guys are already familiar with assessments if you've seen or used clickers. <laughs> <laughs> They're really common. Right. So clickers yeah. are used in a lot, particularly in a larger lecture environment to assess yeah. what students are understanding. And I, we've talked about different ways that they can be done. and. Depending on how you use them, they can be super, super informative. Mm -hmm. And so it's one of those things that 
Yeah, you can get creative with the way you use it. Um, I think that oftentimes the library staff are very helpful in using clickers. I don't know if the specific medical school library here, but certainly the undergraduate campus um, will have resources on how to use clickers. Yeah. And I, something I would just add with that is that I think the key to good clicker activity is being flexible with what the data tells you. Yeah. And not like if the data tells you that they don't understand it or they don't just say, Okay, well, I wasn't prepared to talk about this next. Yeah, right. So once students know that you're ignoring their feedback, yes. they're not going to get future feedback with it. Yes. So it may open up something that you got to discuss. Yeah. Or it may be inconclusive. Yeah. But, but, you know, it, it, I think it's, it's, there is a, a surprise there, but it's, it's, it's good as long as you're willing to work with Absolutely. it. Absolutely. So clickers are good if you are good at thinking on your feet. They're also good to introduce a supportive environment. If you're going to use clickers on the first day, ask a question that has no right answer. To open up the idea that it's you want a discussion in your class. You want somebody to argue one point and somebody to argue another point. At the end, you can say, you both made really great points and I really like how you're thinking. There is no right answer here. So you're sort of opening the door to set the stage for the culture of your classroom with clickers and have it be a place where people can give you their input and their feedback and not feel like if they don't get the right answer, something terrible is going to happen. I know I've definitely tried to pay attention to the outliers, you know, if you get 100 people and 98 yeah. answer the correct, talk about the two. Yeah. yeah. Why is yeah. that Why that distractor? Mm -hmm. well, well, that might be more important than... And that could teach the rest of them something that they hadn't been thinking about. Yeah. Right. And so this is a very important about feedback in both directions, right? Because you're getting feedback as the instructor about what your students do or do not know, but then the students are also getting the feedback from you. Because if you ignore them, that's feedback. And to them that says, they don't really care about what we actually think here. Next time, I'm not even going to bring my clicker because it doesn't matter. So it's feedback in both directions with a very easy task. Um, and so you can incorporate this at any kind of level you want. And of course, the questions can be as challenging or not as you like. I, I watched one instructor, and he actually assigns a group to teach each topic, and the group has to come up with the clicker questions. Mm. So, so that was another way That's I incorporated it. Mm -hmm. That's a really great idea. That's a great formative assessment because the students within the group have to assess their own learning to be able to design questions yeah. that other people are going that are going to be helpful to the rest of the class. And this that's a, a great point also in how you can, as your students are getting more and more comfortable with this, you can kind of make them do some of the hard parts, right? So you can kind of start designing these assessments where your students are actually coming up with the ideas and they're the ones implementing the learning strategies and you've just kind of created the structure for them from the beginning about how these different techniques work. Okay, this is one of my favorites, think pair share. Um, so in this um, strategy, you can tap into how your students are communicating with each other in the classroom. Um, so while we did a concept map at the beginning of the day today, we also sort of did a think pair share. Uh, well, we didn't do the think part, um, but we did pair you guys together in a group and then asked you to share out what your concept maps look like. In a think pair share situation, you would have students, okay, come up with your own ideas about what you think about this topic. You have, you know, one minute to come up with five bullet points. Okay, now get with your partner and discuss and pick your top three bullet points that you came up with. And now I'm going to pick group A, B, and C, and I'd like you guys to share what your top bullet point was. And so you can kind of have the whole classroom working together um, in these little groups and coming up with these different ideas. And this is a very easy one to do because it doesn't require any actual technology. It doesn't require any kind of pre... Um, the students don't necessarily have to have pre-knowledge, but they can. depends on when you implement it. Um, it is pretty important with Think Fair Share, though. As you guys can imagine, uh, your students, if given free reign, will talk about what happened on Saturday night as opposed to what you want them to discuss in the classroom setting. So it's very important um, to provide very explicit questions and explicit instructions here. Um, and if you kind of give them a structure from the beginning, then they'll be more likely to adhere to that structure. And don't give them too much time. Um, because the more time you give them, the more likely they are to drift away from the topic. Um, so you want to keep this pretty short. And again, this is a good one, as Stacy uh, mentioned with the clickers, to do um, earlier on, do stuff that doesn't have a right or wrong answer. Because more so what you're trying to do here is generate discussion amongst the class, um, as opposed to criticizing right or wrong answers. Um, the other part that I want to mention, well, maybe we'll save that at the end. Yeah, we'll go through. Okay, so in addition to formative assessments, one thing that's really important for student learning is self-assessment. 
the, get, getting the students to think about what they've learned and how they've learned it. And so one thing that's easy to do is a one minute reflection or a three, two, one reflection, which you give them either at the end of an activity or at the end of an act, a lecture and basically say, what did you learn today? Okay, so I particularly like this three, two, one just because it has dolphins on it. And I think anytime you can give an adult something that looks like something you'd give a child, it's fun. <laughs> so I would hand this out in one of my classes and be like, I want to know three things you learned, two interesting facts, and one question you still have. Okay, this gets them to think about the stuff that they understand and also to evaluate how well they understand things. And you can take these questions and use them, and if it's something that everybody has the same question, you can address it in the next class. Or if it's one person who has a question, maybe you contact them over email and say, hey, I saw that you really struggled with this, which would be great, because then they feel like you noticed their feedback, right? And so you're forming a connection. But these are also, this is a really great tool to have students tell you what they need to know. Okay, and give them the opportunity to give you feedback on what you're doing. The one minute reflections are also great if you do an activity like a concept map that involves groups and these big pieces of paper and you still want to have something that you can grade. Mm -hmm. So an easy way to turn a formative concept map assessment into something that's graded material, have them do a one minute reflection on the activity. Collect that. Grade that somehow. Yeah. These can be simple as like writing on a note card, submitting a blackboard assignment <coughs> by later that evening, you know, those types of things that you can really easily incorporate and get a physical thing that you could create following the activity. Um, okay, so the strip sequence. Uh, this is a little bit like the card sorting task um, that Jason talked about a couple of weeks ago. Um, so in this case, in the strip sequence, a lot of the stuff that we talk about in science is sequential in a lot of ways. Um, and so the example I just put here um, is sensory perception in the visual system. Um, and so you would provide your students with a list of different terms um, and then ask them to order these terms into the correct order and then they can see how well they're actually processing kind of a systems pathway assessment. Um, and just because I know you guys want to know. <laughs> um, so strip sequences can be used and again, you know, this is a lot of this is your own creativity for your own classroom and whatever topic you're teaching about. Um, you can incorporate all kinds of different things. Just think about anything that has to be presented in a sequential way. This is a really good way to understand to your students. And again, we're a little bit at the that base level of Bloom's taxonomy here, but if I'm teaching about sensory perception of the visual, so visual system, they really need to know that we hit photoreceptors before we hit the lateral geniculate nucleus. Lateral geniculate nucleus. Why do I pick the hardest word to say? <laughs> um, so that's a really important thing. So again, like a, a strip sequence can be used to just kind of gauge whether or not they understand the order of operations that we're working with. And at the end, we'll give you some resources where you can go to look up activities based on a topic you want to look at because otherwise these activities can be a little bit daunting to build. You know, like I might say, I want to talk about central dogma, or I want to talk about photoreception. I don't know how to do that. I don't know what activities are going to work and what activities are not going to work. So there's databases available yeah. that you can search by subject or topic that will give you examples of activities that have already been used. So you can, again, small action, but big change. Don't reinvent the wheel. I feel like I say that all the time to my students and try to remind <clears throat> myself of that. Uh, but there's a lot of people out there doing active learning um, in all sorts of classes, and so there's a lot of resources out there for how you can implement a strip sequence into whatever topic you're talking about. Okay, so one thing that's important to keep in mind is that your efforts may not always work, okay? Especially if it's the first time you're trying it, or you've decided to be a real go-getter and design your own activity so there's no feedback out there about how it works. You don't know. Right? So an important aspect of active learning and of designing assessments is the idea that you're going to try it, assess how it worked, and then tweak it. Okay? People who are really successful at active learning do this every single semester. And they're like, maybe not, maybe not with every activity, but they'll take one activity and really be like, okay, let's, how can we make this one better? Right? And sometimes they just yeah. don't work. You know, sometimes you'll have this activity. I did a signaling pathway once where I paired all the groups up with a different part of the signaling pathway. They read an article and then talked to each other about how the whole signaling pathway worked as a whole in one particular system. And I thought it was going to be fantastic because it was my favorite signaling pathway in my favorite cells. <laughs> so I was like, y'all are going to love this because this is what I love. And about half the class loved it and half the class thought it was the worst thing in the world. Yeah. And that's okay. 
It was a learning experience for me where I could say, here's I can, I can either try it again, or I can say, you know what, maybe this just isn't the right class to do this in. Maybe this would be better suited for a more specific, it was, an, it was a ligodendrocyte, so like a neuroscience class where they're already kind of bought into how cool these cells are, versus a gen bio class where you've got people interested in plants who really don't care how the brain works, right? Okay, so this is, Yeah, so this is again, now we want, because we talked about how important it is to assess our assessments, we would like you guys to assess the assessment that you did in the beginning of class. And we're going to utilize another strategy of think pair share. But we'd like you to pick a name, or take a second and think about it. I always skip that part. Uh -huh. Take a second and think. <laughs> you need to be more than a second. <laughs> It'll be two minutes about our activity today. <laughs> Specifically, do you think we did the activity that we did would help students begin to understand the relationships between DNA, RNA, and protein? What are the potential roadblocks? How can we make it better? And what activity can we give the students to get feedback about activities? Okay, so one minute you said? Yeah. Or like, yeah. They're a smart group. One minute, right? <laughs> yeah. So feel free to share as soon as you're ready. Yeah, as soon as you're ready. <laughs> <laughs> I think it'd be very helpful to organize it into if you were able to get this stuff. That might be so yeah, yeah, yeah. So you're saying you know they get it one like here it is. Um I really like Sorry if I get really loud. I'm used to a 200 person lecture and my voice only has one volume. Um, do we have, did anybody really, really love it? Want to tell us how great we are? You're great. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> Positive feedback is always wonderful, even if you solicit it. Um, so, did anyone have any potential roadblocks to the success of this activity? Anything that you were just like, Ugh, I don't love it. I thought something interesting that we noted in our group was that transcription and translation look rather similar. Mm -hmm. And so if an instructor is walking around, you won't know which one is actually written on the spot. So it'd be okay. difficult to assess where they put it because those are frequently no, confused no. terms. That is not a roadblock I would have thought about. Yeah. That wasn't my idea either. <laughs> <laughs> no, that's neat because a lot of the times what can be, and I noticed with a lot of you guys, you're um, doing a very small concept map, and so because you just have these little pieces of paper, so you're absolutely right, if words look similar, it may be difficult for you as the instructor to have a quick assessment of what you're looking at and what you're seeing um, if words look similar. So that's a very valid point. Absolutely. This group back here had an excellent point about potential roadblocks. Um, so the, one of the roadblocks that we talked about may only affect this group, and if you're teaching your own class, it, it may not come into play, but it's the idea that you have in this room people from lots of different backgrounds. Mm -hmm. And uh, so we were fortunate to pair together um, as two librarians and a faculty developer mm -hmm. to, we could talk about it, but maybe not from a science way and trying to think back to high school and that. Mm -hmm. um, so the idea that we had as far as overcoming that would be to ask the groups if they're of different, um, different topic groups. Um, kind of pair pair specialties together, mm -hmm. and then have them come up with their own concept map of like six key key um, terms from their discipline. Mm -hmm. So that's a way to engage people. So if you're in maybe a non-majors <laughs> class, mm -hmm. you might have difficulty uh, relating biological concepts. You can approach it from what are your majors? Yeah. You know, find people who are in your discipline, and then find a way to relate that back to our lesson, right? Yeah. So one of the other, um, I don't. This wasn't on our list, but a really great way to target that specifically, an activity you can do, and I am totally spacing on what the name of the activity is, um, but it's an activity where you, it's sort of like a um, pair, share, and then regroup, and then like reassemble. Um, and I can't remember how to Jigsaw? Like the name. Jigsaw. God, thank you. So a jigsaw group um, <laughs> activity is where you get with your group, and so it can be regardless of whatever group composition you have. Get with your group, discuss whatever the topic is, if it's making a concept map, whatever. And then you renumber off your groups, 
And so this would be like, okay, one, two, three, one, two, three, and now renumber your groups, reassemble in the new group settings, and you are responsible for educating your new group about what your old group talked about. And so then you go through that, and then you can reassemble back to your original groups, and then have a group discussion about, okay, what did you learn from all your other groups? Let's reassemble. And so it's a really great way to kind of have um, a lot of engagement across different fields and a lot across different groups in the classroom. Um, you just have to be, that, that can be a time consuming one, as you can imagine you're having. And, and also, um, one of the things I want to, I will mention at the end, but since it's coming up now, one of the limitations you can have is um, classroom structure. Um, so if you're in, I just taught at the medical school for the first time today, and I was in a lecture hall with 200 students, and they were huge desks, and they weren't moving around. It was also medical students, so they don't want to go anywhere. Um, but so you can be limited by the space um, available that you have. And so the jigsaw is one that can be difficult if you want to have your students moving around a lot. So you do have to work within the realm of practicality of your physical classroom setting. And, and thinking, as you guys said earlier, thinking about what you want to accomplish. I think yeah. the activity today was more icebreaker. Yep. Let's start Absolutely. seeing what active engagement with the material looks like. Yep. Um, and so, yeah. So the that terms in, in this absolutely. case were not as relevant, exactly. right? So when we're thinking about active learning, there's something that we need to consider, and it's everyone's perspective. Yep. And so we have two more things that we want to kind of do yep. in the last ten minutes. So we're yep. gonna go a little bit yep. quickly, but so <coughs> we're starting out with this lecture, and there's a professor who says that they use active learning in their class all the time. Every minute or two, they're asking questions. And they try to call in students randomly, but they often end up asking the best students in the class so that they can set the standard for the rest of the class. I don't know if you've ever been in a lecture like this or if you've ever taught a lecture like this, but this is somebody who feels like they're very active and feels like everyone in their class is benefiting from it. So, then we've got student number one who thinks the professor is just so engaging, okay? I feel like the class, I have a connection with her and I'm prepared for every class so I can answer the questions. Sometimes when I answer a question, we have a great dialogue in front of the whole class about something more advanced than what's in the syllabus or the reading. I'm learning so much. Okay, so this person is totally bought in. Yeah. Then we have student number two. This class scares me to death. The professor constantly asks questions and I'm terrified she will ask me something I don't know. I don't like to speak in public. I feel that I should sit at the front out of respect, but I aim to the far right to hopefully be out of her line of sight. I can't wait for the semester to end so I can get rid of the stress. So this poor student is trying to be respectful and engaged in the class, but is very uncomfortable with speaking up in front of the class. And so they feel like they're missing out because of this overall level of anxiety that they're experiencing throughout the class. And then student number three, I have no clue what's going on in class. The professor asks a lot of questions, and I usually have no idea what the answer is. I must be really stupid because the kids in the front row know it already. The professor keeps calling on them. It's like they're in the same club or something. I hide in the back so she won't call on me, or I just skip lecture. So, have you guys seen examples of all of these oh, yes. levels of students, or have you been at one of these levels of student and instructor? Yeah. Um, yes, I have. Yes. And <laughs> uh, I've been teaching for a long time and have the scars to prove it. Many students <laughs> do not like active learning strategies. Absolutely. And they say very. Um, uh, negative things on their yes. course evaluations yes. because the tendency for, for a chunk of students is to say, you want me to teach myself and yep. what are you getting paid for? And, and, and yep. this is, I've read about it in other places. It's yes, common absolutely. Thing. So absolutely. just kind of be ready for the fact yep. that. So, and an important thing to note is even though they don't like it, they learn they better. Learn better. Yeah. Yeah. So as much as they'll tell you that they hate it and they're mm -hmm. kicking and screaming the whole time, their grades will do better. They will learn more. The perception of what they understand and what they remember semesters from now will be better than if they had passively sat and listened to you for 50 minutes. Yeah. But So what's important to take away from this is that you have students who are going to react differently to your different activities. And this is why having one activity that's a benchmark is great, but it's always nice to mix it up. So if concept maps are going to be your thing and they're great, mix up how we talk about them. You know. Try and mix up if you get into a group and then one person has to talk or everyone has to talk. Sometimes they have to write something. The more opportunities you can have for different types of student engagement, the more people you're going to say, like, okay, I didn't like this part, but I liked this part. Yeah. Right? And you're tapping into, oh, sorry, was there anything on that? Yeah. 
Oh yeah, go ahead. I was just gonna say two things. Yeah. Um, another strategy I like is, is telling the students before, like at the start of class, we're gonna have do some reporting out. So choose who in your group will be the yep. person that wants to talk. Yes. Uh -huh. um, and then they've already identified that person and when you call on group two, so and so can go ahead and talk. Yeah. Yeah. The other idea is that this is a great time when clickers can be low stress. Yep. Mm -hmm. And taking, if you have a clicker system that allows you to type in uh, full sentences, yeah. then that's yeah. another option. Yeah. yeah, so it's important to give different um, outlets for your students to report out the information because you have many students that love to talk in class and have no problem with that. But then you have plenty of students that don't want to talk in class and do really poorly, that are actually maybe getting the material just fine, but they do very poorly in a high stress anxiety environment. Um, so of all of the different examples um, that we showed you throughout uh, this PowerPoint, and then we have a list again at the end, um, all those have different components to them. And you can restructure these in a lot of different ways to tap into what your students' skills may or may not be. Um, and the, the important thing is that with active learning, with Im implementing these assessments, as Stacy mentioned, the literature and the data is there that students do better when you implement this. And most importantly, students from diverse educational backgrounds do even better with active learning implemented in the classroom. And so, even, so you absolutely are correct that you will get feedback from your students, but one of the ways you can do that is by being up front and saying, we're gonna have some of these reporting out things, or giving them the opportunity for which piece, they, which piece of the puzzle they wanna be. Do you wanna be the writer? Do you wanna be the speaker? That kind of giving them a little more control, because if they feel like they have more control of this environment, then they'll be more comfortable. Um, but that's a very great point to raise. Um, so you, you definitely do need to be prepared for student pushback. Yeah. What do you do with students who are just completely disinterested in participating yeah. in active yeah. learning? Well, go ahead. Yeah. No, 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 because there is one question I have over the other comments. What if students are smarter than a teacher? And mm. for example, I met with a situation when, when students just before such class, because they were very stressed, just like uh, each of the students read one paragraph and just volunteer to answer a question from one paragraph of the study, like the whole class like divide, divided the material in case the professor would ask about something. And basically, if you ask someone, especially for something else, not to take the one person who volunteer, they have no idea what they were talking about. But if you take the person who volunteer, and in each question, other person like volunteer to answer, they answer perfectly. So basically, they were like trying to make you see them like someone. Yeah, exactly. So they were dividing up the work beforehand, yeah. and yeah. then at, okay, for, I so see. In example, yeah. in point, you need to create, get the list of topics you will discuss on each lecture. Yes. So yeah. they need to have time to prepare for that. Yeah. I used to always just go to the like the list of students that I had and just go go through and go through each one. <laughs> Be like, okay, I have a question for you guys, all right, if this person's up and then ask. Like, so by modifying your techniques, though, like students are always going to try to find a way to be yeah. successful without yeah. actually being successful. Yeah. But by modifying your techniques, you can hopefully minimize that and start to identify like if they're dividing up the work, then they no longer get to volunteer and I'm the one who gets to pick. Okay. Or another strategy you could do is if something is a presentation-based thing, tell them that they're all going to have to prepare for the presentation, but I'm not going to tell you which one of you is presenting until the day of. And right. what in, if the answer of student is that there are some students who are afraid to talk in public? Yeah. Then they, you can work out them? situations with them okay. where yeah. they can, yeah. Like, so you can give a lot of preparation <coughs> and say like, we're going to have to talk out loud. We're going to we're going to figure it out. You can do things where maybe you have a student come and give you their presentation during your office hours in private. Okay. That's these, something that you can these do. are all and so this all comes back to this concept of like it's a continual feedback loop between you and the students. And every semester, every group of students is going to be different. You can have one semester where you have a classroom of duds. And I mean every one of them is, right? I'm sure many of you who have experienced this a lot can attest to that. And then one semester you may have like, God, everybody's really into this this semester. They're all jiving together. They're all friends. Like this is going great. And so I think that that's, I think these are issues that are going to happen almost no matter what you do. Um, but what we can emphasize is as long as you're mixing up the different strategies, you're incorporating different aspects and different techniques 
then the students can't always get into like a specific pattern of behavior, and then you just are getting continual feedback. When you know that students are doing a certain, I mean, you're gonna know, you know, as a professor, you're gonna know what they're doing. They and just because they don't like it doesn't necessarily mean, like you can hear feedback and decide not to change something. Or you can right. hear feedback and say, that's a really good point, this is how we can address it, and this is yeah. what we're gonna do going forward. Yeah. But it doesn't mean that if you get feedback, you have to constantly be reassessing yeah. your whole thing, right? Here we have only a couple more minutes. Um, is there anything anyone really wanted to say about this topic? Because it is kind of an important one. Um, okay, so maybe a little. We I don't know that we'll actually have time to do this, but we'll send you all the slides from today so that you can do it yourself. We wanted to also talk about how to evaluate our summative assessments yeah. and to see if the questions that we're putting on exams are reflecting the level of our class our learning objectives, and what we want the students to learn. So we actually have some questions from an exam that I gave in a 200 levels majors course. And we were going to go through and say, like, you can do like the first one, okay. what level of Bloom's taxonomy we think they are. OK, so this is our first example. So you can take a second to read it, OK? And then when you think you have an idea of where it falls in the Bloom tax Blooms, just raise your hand. Understanding. Understanding. Okay, so we have a vote for understanding. Any contrary opinions? Yeah, Jonathan agrees. I'd go at least to application, if not analysis. Application okay. or analysis? Okay. Okay, so let's think about this. If this is an intro bio class, this is the first time that they talked about the properties of water, where do you think it would fall? What do they need to know to be able to understand this question? They need to know what the properties of water are. Do they need to know anything about how those properties might work together? Yeah. And do they need to understand it in a different environment than they might have learned it? Okay, so I would argue, not just because I wrote it, but that it's more of in the apply analyzing part. Because it's an extra piece beyond what are the chemical properties of water. Okay? how far, how high up that extra piece goes, then really kind of depends on the level of a class. Mm -hmm. Like if this is a biochem class and this is a question in the first test, this is a gimme question to make them feel good about themselves, mm -hmm. right? But in an intro class, this is one of our more difficult, do you really understand what we've been talking about? Okay. Um, so there's a couple others on here. Um, we're just gonna jump through because we're pretty much out of time. Um, but please feel free to look at Stacy's exam questions and provide your email feedback on them. Yeah, okay. if, if there's a way you can make it better, let me know. Um, so these are the take-home techniques that we talked about. Um, I also talked about Jigsaw that you can throw in there as well. Um, and I think these PowerPoint will be provided okay, good. Um, to you guys. Um, but again, there's a ton of material out there. Um, and oh yeah, we have it. Oh yeah. Okay, well, we already talked about handling student resistance, including <laughs> um, remarks. There's a lot of different ways, and we kind of already discussed that. Um, again, over the course of the semester, students will certainly get more comfortable um, with having assessment and active learning. Um, oh, and this is a good point that um, kind of overall in the at least American education system, a lot more of the K-12 through educators are doing active learning assessments. Um, so it may be that as we're getting influx of newer, newer generations of students, we might be just seeing students that are already prepared for this type of learning. Um, so it may be that things are going to get easier with student resistance um, as we move forward with new generations of students. Um, diversity, we've talked about diversifying assessments, learning in line with your objectives. These are resources. And, oh, Center for Teaching and Learning Excellence, a little plug for them. They're here at BCU. Um, they have great resources there, um, and they know infinitely more about this topic than Stacy and I do. Um, so they're a great resource uh, that is over on the Monroe Park campus. And then, of course, finally, Small Actions Big Change. And then here are a number of references as well as websites and resources for you guys um, to get more info on different types of assessments. Um, there's a book, 50 Tacks, which is literally 50 different types of assessments you can use. Uh, there's a PDF version of it on the web. Um, the University of Delaware and the University of Buffalo yeah. both have 
searchable databases for case studies and different activities that you could do based on discipline or topic. So if you get to a point where you say, I really want to look at an Alzheimer's case study, you can start there. Yep. Okay. Any, any questions? We went over just a tad. Yeah. But we'll Sorry for keeping you guys. Yeah, we'll hang around if anyone has other questions. Thank you guys so much. Thank you. Great. Thank you. Thank you.